to Dead Man Talking. Tonight's story has been personally written and edited by myself, DMT. Uh, very nervous about this, guys. I've never released a story of my own uh, to you guys. I, I hope you enjoy it. Of course, please do let me know down below your thoughts or feedback. It's very much appreciated. Uh, it's not finished yet, guys. There is more to this. I'm thinking of making this uh, interactive story so you can decide the outcomes and the endings. But so far, we're up to three parts. This being part one. Without further ado, let's get into tonight's story. I'd like to entitle The LBL Type 3. Let's get straight into that. If you are like me, then you grow up in a small country town where everyone knows each other's business. The LBL, a beautiful landscape, breathtaking to many, it chanting to most who witness its natural beauty, but to those who really know what hides within those dense green forests. Those who have also been raised here in towers of monstrous hairy beasts, shape-shifting demons, whose sole interest is only to consume as much human flesh as they can latch and tear their long black claws into. Fortunately, I had my daddy and grandpa to tell me the stories told to him from his father and so forth. One such occasion, he told me of a friend, a hunter. He said that he was an experienced woodsman who had grown up in the deep woodland of Georgia and then moved to Kentucky as a young man to work on a farm. On an early crisp morning, he headed out before light and took his ATV far into the forest. From where it was found, he had travelled on the ATV nearly two miles before getting off and making his way on foot through the thick brush. According to the other farmhands, he was out scouting an area for a tree stand. Now, here is where it gets strange. After he doesn't show up for work the next morning, a few workers are sent to look for him, or the ATV. After many hours, they found the ATV and began tracking him through the thick brush that would snag and whip at their faces. It was almost like a fight of defiance to which the forest wanted to keep its secrets hidden. As late afternoon approached, the men came across a scene of chaos. Broken branches six to seven feet in the air, either side of a now newly made trail. Whatever had torn through here was in a hurry and of nightmare size. Some of the branches as thick as five inches in diameter. The forest was silent. The men looked at each other. Wide eyes, no words were said for at least two minutes. They just stared, waited. We need to head back now, said one of the men, clearly shaken by this strange and chilling sight before him. At the very moment, something terrifying let out a god-awful howl or roar. It was some distance away, but still way too close for anyone's liking, especially this far and deep into the forest. Let's move, said the men, as they turned tail and started to head back the way they had came. It was now approaching 4.15pm. The sun was setting soon. Whatever that was, they did not need nor want to find out. Unsure of whether they would make it out of the forest before nightfall, the men picked up pace. Hearts pounding, minds racing, trying to figure out what the hell caused all that destruction to the trees and brush. More to the point, what in God's name was out here with them? The howling rang out again, this time much closer, and more than one. The entire forest took on a deathly ambience. No animals could be heard, only the wind and their footfalls. Snap! Crash! Oh God! shouted one of the men who was at the back of the group. As the others turned, his headless body fell limp to its knees before falling upon the forest floor. Blood running between the golden and auburn leaves like lava. Ah! Screaming erupted from the group and all of them scattered into different directions. Just then, another cry of agony and silence. Each man choosing his fate with the direction he took. Out of the six men that went in search, only one young man of 20 years old returned. Speaking of monstrous bipedal creatures with eyes as black as a great white shark's, 
and powerful muscular bodies. And to top that off, a mannerism that of a serial killer. He said how they had all scattered their separate ways, and whilst most of them ran in a similar direction, he ran in a complete other. To this day, he doesn't know why he did that. Anyway, he managed to break for a small ravine with creek in the bottom. When he got there, he positioned himself in a huge old hollow oak that had fallen many years prior. And here is where he stayed all night. Soon, night had fallen, and the forest was a menacing place to be alone. So young, surely they will find me, he thought. To make matters worse, he was completely soaked through, and soon the temperature had dropped considerably. Steam bellowed from his mouth as he breathed in the crisp night air. I've got to get out of here, but how, he thought. Suddenly, a scream shattered the night silence. It was close, about half a mile. However, now, it was a man's screams. Snap! The struggling and screaming stopped abruptly. Sheer panic pulsed through the young man's body as his heart leapt like a hammer to his sternum. Silence. That sobering and chilling silence was back. Crack, crunch. Oh God, no, please no, he said as the sounds of nearby footfall could be heard. It was on two feet. It must be one of the workers, he thought to himself. Panic again, as he knew the creatures were close. He decided to creep up and take a quick look out of the log through a crack in the enormous trunk. What stood only 10 to 15 feet away was in his words, a huge, evil looking canine creature, at least seven to eight feet tall, covered in thick jet black fur. It had hands, hands he screamed, with razor sharp claws that appeared to be two or three inches long. But what happened next is what still haunts him to this day. As he looked at this monster before him, questioning if this would be his very last moments, it turned its head ever so slowly to face him and then bared his teeth. Blood and tissue still dripped and dropped from its maw. It slowly raised its hand and pointed straight at him with a sinister sneer across its face. He crouched behind the full security of the fallen tree. His mind raced. Do I run? He thought. I fuck that. I must be miles from the farm. Do I fight? Then, crack, rings out through the forest. The young man turned to see lanterns and folk running his way. But the monster, he thought. He looks and realises that it's gone. Nowhere to be seen. It didn't even make one sound in its retreat. I'm here! I'm here! He screamed to grab their attention and secure his ticket to safety. Unfortunately for him, once the dogman of the land between the lakes has scented you, it is only a matter of time before he will return to finish his business with you. <coughs> Around a month after the attack on the workers, my grandfather started to work at the farm with the other replacements. Some of the original crew were already gone. Others demanded higher pay. They got it. Within a few weeks of working at the farm, my grandfather had made himself at home and grew closer to the crew. Soon, one night as they cooked pot roast on the fire pit, the terrifying occurrence was raised. They explained what had taken place that fateful night and how easily and swiftly these men were massacred one by one. All except the young man. He had survived, barely. As soon as he was conscious and able to stand, he caught the first train out of the state. With the young man screaming of huge man-like beasts blacker than the night itself, standing on two or four feet, the smell of death. The remaining farmhands looked at each other, some in complete disbelief, others clearly shaken by his words and pale complexion. Out of the remaining crew that survived 15 seasoned hunters, only six original members remained. As my grandfather heard these stories, he questioned whether it was just them trying to spook him and the other new farmhands. But from the serious, dead stare in each man's eyes, he soon realised that they had seen or heard something very much real. 
and the land that he now worked day and night was much, much darker, much more dangerous than he had ever considered in rural Kentucky. As he sat, questions racing through his mind, the tree line seemed to almost mock and laugh as it swayed in the nighttime breeze. Soon, it was time to turn in for the night. Early start tomorrow, he thought, as the men headed off to their bunks. Remaining beer dashed onto the hot embers of the fire, sending ash and sparks flying high into the night. If only they had noticed the set of eyes watching them from the brush only a few meters away. They would have had some warning. Ah, who am I kidding? It never stood a chance. Later that night, as the men slept, exhausted from a long day work in the fields and the property, a force of nature lurked and crept ever so silently across the meadow on to the property. Every nighttime critter and bug held its breath and humble chorus as the woods and surrounding land were dropped into a new quiet ambience. A deathly weight had fallen on the land and everything felt it. It was my grandfather who had awoken first. He describes this as the single most shocking moment in his life. A strange noise had awoken him from his deep slumber, and as he did, he could feel his chest vibrating inside and out. It was a growl. Then, the wet slurping and gasps. Oh shit, he shouted, as he opened his eyes to a scene of utter violence and gore. Jimmy, who was in the bunk next to him, was in his bunk, eyes wide, mouth open, blood coughing and spitting from his mouth. But it was what was atop of him that really drained the blood from his face. A enormous black wolf-like creature hungrily lapping and chewing into Jimmy's throat with a vigorous, hungry pace. All the while its eyes locked onto my grandfather. Just then, it let out the most tremendous growl as he sat there, speechless, looking around the room. Each man's throat cut the very same way, now very much dead. Just then, it stopped its nauseous act of greed and stood slowly to a bipedal position, eyes still locked on my grandfather. Pure terror ran through him like a bolt of lightning. As they say, fight or flight kicked in and well, he chose both. He grabbed at the oil lantern next to his bedside and threw it just at the creature as it made its move. He rolled himself in one motion off the bed to the floor with a harsh crash. Finding his feet, he grabbed at his Zippo lighter that his father had given him as a good luck present and he ignited it. The creature was already mid-jump straight for him let out another howl, but this time, it was different. It had pain in it, and it was a mix of screaming and a howl. They collided as the flames rushed up the creature's body, it knocking my grandfather to the cabin floor, where he cracked his head and shattered his eye socket, knocking him unconscious. All he remembers seeing before his unconsciousness gripped him was the creature's screams and it running and crashing through the doorway, its sheer size obliterating the wooden wall that was dwarfed by its sheer enormous bulk and then blackness. Turns out the farmer heard all the commotion and rushed outside to a scene no man should ever have to witness. Blood and tissue covering the walls, ceiling and floor, thick with claret and flesh. My grandfather still laying on the floor in a pool of blood forming around his lifeless looking body. The farmer rushed as soon as he see him laying there, different to the rest. Obviously, he had made an attempt to flee whatever in God's name had taken place that night, on his land, on his watch. This has to stop. It has to end now, he remarked to himself. Now! So, my grandfather was rushed to hospital, and the farm was overwhelmed with authorities of all the damn alphabet. <sighs> Jeez. The tough son of a bitch had 115 staples to his cranium, and a serious case of PTSD. He said he would never, ever sleep after that night, 
in case that son of a bitch wanted more. <laughs> what a guy. Unfortunately, the farm took on a dismal turn for the worst, as nobody would work there, let alone sleep. Plus, the feds had a lot of spooks patrolling the tree line and land in the forest. Apparently, gunshots could be heard every now and then, with some larger crews entering the forest during the earlier hours of the morning. We're talking like 2 or maybe 4 a.m. Some returning in smaller numbers, some clearly injured and on stretchers. Every time they would bet their asses, they would have a visit at sunup. No questions answered, just orders or, really, threats. My grandfather returned to the farm after a short stay at the hospital, where he was met with the old farmer, on his front deck, whiskey in hand, straight from the bottle. This looks promising, he thought. The farmer explained how he had no luck in hiring new hands, how he might as well just give up. He was too old and too scared, if he was honest, to face this, whatever it is. Creature in an all-out war. With that, he welcomed him home and told him to rest. They would speak in the morning. As the sun rose and the two men enjoyed their cups of coffee, each not breaking the morning's calm essence, time passed and the old man spoke. Do you think it can be done? He said. What? Said my grandfather. The beast! Do you think it can be killed? Oh, well, I, I don't know said grandfather. I had hoped it was long gone after I lit it up like a goddamn candle. I mean, sure, it was definitely hurt, but killing it? I I don't know. I really don't know. The f they finished their coffee and headed to the truck to grab some supplies from town, some four or five miles away. They arrived in town and headed straight for the hardware store. There, they purchased round iron grills for the windows to the property and plenty of timber to secure the property as best as they could. All the while, they was wondering if this was even worth it. After all, it had made light work of the bunk's cabin whilst on freaking fire. Still, they purchased what they could in an attempt to protect themselves and the house. As soon as they left the store and grabbed some lunch in Wendy's, they sat trying to figure out a plan of action. A plan A, B and C. Hell, the whole damn alphabet if need be. As my grandfather sat eating some bacon and grits with cheese, easy on the pepper, <laughs> he noticed a couple of men outside who seemed to be arguing or upset. Soon, the men walked into the diner, clearly pale white, sweating and covered in mud. He couldn't help but keep an eye on them and an ear. As the old farmer sat, also trying to enjoy his lunch, snapping the bacon with a menacing sound, my grandfather listened, as he did, to his horror and disbelief. They were talking in hushed tones, but he could definitely make out the words. Eyes as black as night, cruel and savage beast, it stood on two feet. Grandfather said he felt his stomach lurch and blood draining from his face, all whilst the old farmer hungrily snapping his juicy bacon, like a carnivorous beast himself. A stark comparison to the dogman, as he would soon learn to call it. The farmer soon noticed the shocked and disbelief in my grandfather's face. He turned to see what he was looking at with such terror written across his face. Are you good boy? asked the farmer. You don't look well, do you want to leave? Grandfather turned to look him in the eyes and said, they have seen it too. Right then, the old farmer drops his coffee with a loud crash and the cutlery follows. By the time that the old farmer realised what was happening, my grandfather was approaching the men, and as he did so, he noticed it wasn't just clay and mud on their clothes. No, there was also some blood. Clearly, they had tried to wash away. The two strange men noticed my grandfather approaching them fast and turned tail straight for the door. But Grandpa wasn't going to let it slip away that easy without finding out what had happened. He chased after the men, both who now had jumped into their truck and were hauling ass out of the parking lot. Grandpa hot on the heels in his truck and giving chase. They took the freeway east. It was the exact same direction that the farmer and he had needed to take home. Soon, he was catching up 
when a rig pulls out in front of him, sending my grandfather off the road and into the embankment brush. Shit! said my grandfather as he slams the truck into reverse and backs onto the freeway, bleaching the tyres as he pushed his foot to the floor on the gas and in the direction they had headed. Come on, come on! He was screaming as he takes turn after turn trying to spot the damn truck. By now, it's getting near dusk and the light is fading fast. He found himself on a desolate road way back in the country, fearing the worst and near to giving up. A set of headlights catches his attention as he meets the crest of a small hill in the road. Then they turned off. What the fuck? He thought. As he got closer, he realises it's the damn truck he's been looking for. And before they can react, he slams on the gas and parks right across their track, boxing them in. The two men reach for their weapons, but Grandfather was a slick old bastard, you see. He had already drawn his ready. Drop them, he shouts. I just want to talk, okay? He instructs the men, who now clearly are doing exactly as he says. <laughs> All three got out onto the soon pitch dark country road. The men begin pleading and talking over one another. Enough, said my grandfather. I know what you've seen. I too have danced with that piece of shit son of a bitch beast. Hell, I set his ass on fire. In turn, he fractured my eye socket and messed me up good. But it's my co-workers, my friends, who really got hit. That son of a bitch chewed each one of their throats out whilst I slept. I ain't nobody's damn chew toy. Not my ex-girlfriends or this damn creature. The men relaxed and began to introduce themselves. D and Riz. Two brothers, although neither really looked related, apparently. Anyway, they explained what the hell had happened to them and why they were covered in so much mud, clay and blood. Dee went on to explain that the day before, they and a friend, Brett, had been camping and bow hunting on the north end of the LBL for a week. All was great for the first half of the week, but come that Thursday evening, things drastically and without warning turned into a nightmare. Branches and twigs being snapped or crushed, trees shook violently as the creature lurked and circled them. Soon their camp kept being rushed or charged by something huge and powerful and fast. They only caught a glimpse here and there but soon it crashed through the surrounding trees and stood abruptly right in front of them. They stood there shaking as they told Grandfather how it roared at all of them, sending hot, rotten breath and drool flying all over them. Silence fell upon the camp, only the campfire crackling and heavy wheezing breath of this huge dogman took as it waited for their response. It didn't have long to wait. They all screamed as it eyed each one of them up and down, but it didn't attack. Not until Brett threw his beer bottle at it, like a toothpick for fuck's sake, and took off running back towards the trowel nearby. Dee and Riz looking at each other realised it was now their turn as the creature took a huge step forwards towards the two brothers, each jumping to one side to avoid the dogman's dark, sharp claws. Shh! Dee grabbed his younger brother and hauled us towards the opposite direction. Just before doing so, he kicked the remaining logs of the fire into the face of the now extremely close dogman. With a scream of white hot pain, the embers burned and hissed as they burned the skin and hair of the dogman. It wasn't much, but maybe it was enough to get them out, get them back to the truck. Sheer terror coursed through their minds and blood. Adrenaline soaring through the bloodstream, feet and hands clawing and grabbing at the land in the pitch black night, trying desperately to get away from the dogman. As they ran, they soon realised that they were not being pursued. At least, not yet. Dee grabbed Riz and they both tumbled down a small creek embankment to the hide and gathered their breath. They found a small natural dugout in the embankment with plenty of hanging foliage and grass to provide some cover, they thought. Hopefully. Soon, it was more than clear. Brett had indeed met his maker as a shrill but short scream shattered the silent forest and was extinguished abruptly. 
Not far, said D. What the hell do we do now? said Riz. D, lost in his own nightmare thoughts of what ifs, etc., snapped back to reality and said, We run. As soon as sun is up. For now, let's stay here. It's probably our best shot of surviving this damn nightmare. And so, they waited it out. Apparently, those were the longest four hours of their young lives. They heard the dogman growling and pacing just above their heads. Heard its terrifying howling as it got more and more pissed off that it couldn't find them. At one point, they said it had been moving through the treetops, trying to get a better view of them. But the hanging foliage seemed to be enough in a dark night to keep them covered. They said it moved without even making a sound. Grandfather listened to these men tell their story, not daring to blink or even ask a question as they continued on. Well, sun came up, said D. We waited for as long as we could stand it, but we were going crazy, you know, he retorted. Soon, D and Riz crept out of the safety of the hiding place. The cold morning breeze sent chills up and down each of their spines. We should look for Brett, said Riz. He's gone already, said D. But, said Riz, but nothing, said his older brother, now clearly taking responsibility of his brother's life very seriously. We need to get back on the trail and back to the truck, said D. The two men headed off to the forest, everything around them still deathly silent, trying their very best not to make too much noise as they paced through the leaves and brush. Oh God, no, cried Riz as they rounded a turn in the trail. There before them, some 20 feet in the tree, yep, you guessed it, was Brett. Well, what was left of Brett. He had been completely torn in half, his insides falling down to the forest floor, bugs and a fox there before them, making the most of this warm, juicy offering. But what really shook them, to their core, their very being, was what was jammed firmly inside Brett's mouth. It was his beer bottle, the very one he'd thrown at the dogman before taking off into the forest. Fuck this, said D and Riz, as they began to quicken their pace to a steady jog, now not caring if it heard them. They had to move, and now. Eventually, two odd hours later, exhausted and cut and bruised from the rough terrain and challenging pace of which they kept all the way back to the trailhead, they found their truck and peeled the hell out of there. Tears of relief streamed down both of the brothers' faces as they finally realised they were safe for now. That's when they made it into town and hit the diner for some food and drink. Grandfather looked at the men in utter shock that they had made it out, out of its domain, its home, its kingdom. Speechless as he was, he asked the men to accompany him back to the farm for some supper and a bed for the night. They gladly obliged. That evening, over supper, the farmer, D, Riz and my grandfather were discussing what the hell this dogman could be and how in hell are they going to get rid of such a cunning, menacing beast. Then the brother said a prayer for their friend Brett and for his spirit to find peace. Then they all turned in for the night, exhausted from the past few days and nights of pure terror. Where were the damn chickens? Or the coyotes? Again, the night was silent and still. Too still. Wow. There we go guys and girls, hope you enjoyed. Um, gonna write a few more parts and bring those out and then as I say, I want to make this an interactive story where you decide the ending, a choice of three. Um, hope you guys are enjoying this story and uh, please do give me your feedback down below in the comment section. Of course, again, please do like and share. And above all, if you're thinking of taking a trip to the LBL, maybe do a little bit of history. Check the internet, Google, you know. It's pretty deep and dark. But above all, remember, be safe, not sorry.